Well, gee, I hope everything works now. G'day, I'm Steve Hay. Welcome to the wonderful world of woodworking and the Carpet Check YouTube channel. If you've got any questions, please hook in and ask. And today, we're going to be covering dovetails. Just basic dovetails. I've just got to make sure that's working because I'm getting absolutely no feedback here. So please just bear with me. And is it good? It looks like I've got sound. Everything good out there, Trevor? Can you hear me? That's all I need. G'day, mate. How are you? Hi, Derek. How are you? Welcome along. What I was just doing, which I'll just finish off now, is I'm just preparing a couple of boards so we can do some dovetailing. I'm going to make sure. Oh, this is mayhem here this morning. Absolutely. It's funny, isn't it? You get, you get one glitch and it just throws everything out of whack. Let me just make sure my cameras are working. That's, that's working there, but you don't want that one. Hang on, you're going to get seasick in a minute because I'm just going to move this. Ethel, if you're watching, I need some watermarks. So you don't see my bandsaw. No, there's a scroll saw, but it's a great scroll saw. Got to tell you, I'm just filling in time here. Um, yeah, I've got a lot of heavy marquetry. That I'm doing very shortly. And that scroll saw is the bee's knees. Let me just move this one in. There we go, and then when we're doing that, we can do that one. And you've got that one, and let's see if everything else is working. There you go. Well, you get to see me legs. Okay. Seems to be working. Darf, good morning. You can hear me. <laughs> That's great. I love it when the sound works and everything else works. It's good. Thomas, good morning. Car uh, Jerry, Jerry, sound is on. You look good. Oh, thanks, mate. Did you like the profile? Lovely to have you on board. <laughs> oh, there you go. Will do. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, don't you like to be bilingual? Yeah, um, yes, so, whatever I was saying I was going to do, I, I, I just got to find myself. Have you ever had that when you stand up and your mind sits down? Whew, um, dovetails, that's what we're doing. Okay, what I was preparing here was just some stock material so we can um, cut some dovetails. What I've seen in the past is people machine, excuse me, machine the timber up, then cut the dovetails, and then realise they've still got machining marks on their timber, whether it's joint of blades or thickness of blades or tear out or anything like that. Oh, I'll sand it out later. Unfortunately, if, you, if you're doing dovetails for a, the box, pfft, not a drama. If you're doing it for a drawer, however, can present problems because you're reducing the thickness of the side of the drawer. So even though you put it together initially, you've got a really nice tight fit. And here's a, here's a little bit of trivia for you. On the white star line, of which the Titanic was one, the carpenters on there, the uh, head foreman, to check the drawers on the bedside tables or any, any drawers, the test used to be, Get your finger, bottom right hand corner of the drawer and push it in. And if it didn't catch, it was a good drawer. If it caught, it meant the drawer was too uh, narrow and it was kinking in the cavity. Or if it wouldn't go in, it was too wide and it needed something taken off. So there you go. Bit of trivia I just thought I'd share. Hello, Bob. Bob has entered the building. Are you going to say hello? Just come in here. What? Come here. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on, fat sir. Come on, you can do it. There you go. And say hello. It's a, oh, you got claws. Don't dig them in. I've got nothing for you to eat. I'm sorry, mate. Come on, I'm working. Come. <laughs> he comes in. Yeah, anything to eat. What are you going to do? Are you staying in or going out? Because I'm shutting the door because I've got the air conditioner on. You're going to stay in for a bit? You stay in for a bit. Okay. Where do we get up to? Um, yes. So it's important if you can get into the routine of finishing, 
And I look, I don't care if you sand it. Uh, it doesn't matter, but finish it to get, <laughs> excuse me, I'll be back. There you go. If you get into the habit of finishing it and, or sanding it, planing it, whatever, to size before you actually measure the dovetails because it will make a difference to the mating parts. So I think I'll just about finish that. These ones are done. I'll pop that up there. Oh, okay. And I must admit, that I just, it's nice, isn't it? Better than noisy machines. Okay. The dovetails really, they're a very a basic joint, but over, I don't know, maybe the last 50 years, well, I'm dating myself now, but definitely since the 80s, the dovetails become more of a, a showpiece joint than an actual structural joint, even though it is a structural joint. It's a compression joint, and it works exactly the same as the keystones that masonry, masoners use in archways. If you look at an archway, there's a dovetail shaped keystone in there and that holds the arch together. So it's got the weight of the stones leaning on it and that wedge shape locks it together so the wall stays up. Much the same with dovetails. They're a compression joint and used in drawers. When you pull the drawer, it actually locks into itself and that keeps the drawer front off. If you just had a butt joint on there, over time that would weaken and you'd pull the drawer front off. There are a couple of other variations in drawer construction, but dovetails I think are the most common. And now what was I looking at the other day? Apparently there was a Roman fresco going back, um, I, I don't even know the, the day, but let's face it, if I get past last week, it's all ancient history, but let's say 100 years BC. And there was a fresco and a carpenter was working on a job and he was actually cutting a dovetail. So they've been around for a long, long time. We'll cut them in a minute. Um, you might be familiar with, actually, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll just, <laughs> I know, totally unprofessional. I'm just going to get a draw board down, which I meant to go and get. And I'll show you, this would have to be the, oh, come on. Da -da -dum. There we go. This would have to be the most complex drawer I've ever made. No one's in the house. There you go. Let me try it again. Boom, ba -dum. Saturday morning, I'll come down here. Hey, darling. Hey, darling. You're live. You're, you're famous. Could you do... <laughs> she do me a favour. Grab the, that deep drawer out of the sideboard. All right. Yeah, and just empty it if you could bring that down. Then it's all right. You can come on, and I won't put the camera on you and your nighty. All right. Thanks, Dale. Good on you. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Yeah, I just like to show you this particular drawer because it will show you how complex dovetails can be. But anyway. Uh, one of the things you find a lot of the time is, who have we got anyone coming in? Next time I'll walk through a uh, cart to last one, I'll now know why the two-ton blocks are not falling crash <laughs> mass or walk under them. <laughs> yeah, well, they're actually called keystones, but it's the same dovetail shape. Anyway, you might be familiar, people go, oh yeah, I'm doing a dovetail and it's a six-in-one or an eight-in-one. They're the two main sizes you find when you're doing furniture, for example, or boxes. Uh, boxes are a different kettle of fish, but we'll cover those later on. Uh, so how do they arrive at 6-in-1 and 18 one It's easy. My, just off the, uh, off the record, not off, no, it's, it's on the record because it's on a stream, isn't it? For your information, my preferred dovetail is a five and a quarter in one. There is a uh, a secret dovetail, Japanese dovetail joint I do, and that actually is a four-in-one. And I was looking for it, but no way in the world I couldn't find it. Let me just have a... Is it down under all that rubbish? Mm. 
No, I don't know where it is. Anyway, it's not the sort of thing you'd want to try just for fun. So, how they work it out, and I'm going, I'm going imperial here, people. So it's not because I've got grey hair. It's because this is what they're actually, the dovetails are based on and how they get the ratios. Let me move a camera around here so you can see and we'll go, that one there looks good. Okay. And now a six in one is actually, it's the same as a gradient on a hill. It's six inches up, one inch in. So if we come in one inch on this piece of paper, coming in one inch, and we're going up. Oh, excuse me, be back. Oh, thank you, darling. Oh, you're a treasure. Thank you. So, oh. Boom, boom, boom. Oh, dear. And you go up six inches. And you put a mark. Well, let's see if we can get a bench cam working on this one. Be good if we could, but not. I, I want to get pneumatic. Uh, there we go. I want to get pneumatic tripods that just float in the air, wouldn't it? Wouldn't that be cool? Okay, so we've come in an inch from the edge here to there, and we've gone up six inches to there. Now, if you join that line, gone up six in one. That line is a six in one dovetail. And just to double check it, that's a six in one jig. And if we put the jig up to the line, that's it. So that's how they arrive at the different ratios. What they mean or what they're for, is the wider um, dovetail, so the lower the number, the wider the dovetail, is used for softwood, because softwood has a lot of pith and soft grain in it, and as it shrinks and as it gets used, it will compress more, so you might start out with a six in one, and after many years of use, it could come down to a five and a half in one. So if you started with an 18 one which is a narrower dovetail, over time that could flatten out and it wouldn't have that locking effect that uh, the 6-in-1 does. I will show you this drawer oh, that I made many, many years ago. Where are we? And I used... There you go. I used an 18 one on this one, and there's actually, I think it's 50, 50 odd dovetails. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 46. There you go. 46 dovetails. And all hand cut. And as you can tell, the drawer itself was not straight. And oh, look at that. I made it about 30 years ago to fix that. But anyway, um, yeah, that was a labour of love. But that was an eight in one because that timber I used was, what was it? Red river gum and blue gum. Being a hardwood, I could get away with that narrower dovetail. Hokey dokey. So that's how you work out to make your dovetail. You can make your own jigs. Um, 
Oh, there you go. That's that's uh, four in one. What are we on to? That's actually a four in one. That's the one I use on the Japanese dovetails. And we'll get into those later on of how to make your own. But there are some really good ones on the market. These and I bought these from Carbotech, I think. Gee whiz. Would have been about 30 years ago. So I don't know if they still stock them, but you can always check it out. And they were just anodised aluminium, cut at an angle with the lip on it, so I can use those as jigs. Um, I know they have these. So I was in the shop the other day. And these are really, really nice jigs. And they give you a nice amount to put over your job and you've got nice sharp edges to work against. That's a one in eight and that's a one in six. So they're available. And if I, I mentioned on the test stream that we did a little while ago that for whatever reason, if you're unsure, um, you uh, have problems holding the saw straight, or in uh, my, my dad's case, my dad had Parkinson's, wasn't really severe, but it was enough to give him uh, the tremors. And if you still want to do woodwork, this is fantastic. It is actually... I was going to get one out and have it all set up. What's this one? This is an 18 in one. But just see how wonderful this is. Dad had these. These were around when my dad was alive. I reckon I would have bought him some. There we go. Okay, so that is the angle. See if we can get a better shot. That's the angle of the dovetail, and look at this. It's a magnet. So you just let your saw against the jig and start cutting, and you will be cutting perfect dovetails every time. And that comes in, yeah, a one in six and a one in eight as well. So there's some opportunity for you or oh, failing that if you you don't want to do the jigs and you want to do it the way I did it um, ba -ba -ba -bum. just use a sliding bevel and what you would do draw up the angles that you want and then put your sliding bevel on the bottom of the paper or the, the edge of it and then bring it around to follow that slope. I've got shadows here, there you go. And that should be pretty darn close to a six in one. There you go. So there are many, many ways of getting your angle. Once you've got your angle, you're halfway there. Now we've got to set it out. Um, oh, let's talk about saws to start with. I'm going to use a, a Japanese saw for this. You can use, I've actually done a video previously where I used a $9.95 shark tooth saw from the big store warehouse just to prove you don't need to have specific saws to do it. I'll tell you, it's a lot easier if you have because you get a finer cut and you've got more control. But if you're starting out, it is not necessary. Japanese saws work well. I like this one because it's got a, a changeable blade and very nice fine teeth. There are the gent saws. These are uh, just packs gent saws. Now, sometimes I take the, uh, whatever you call it, the kerf off, so it's flat and it gives me a finer cut, but horses for courses. 
They're, they're not a bad uh, scroll saw, uh, scroll saw, dovetail saw. Then you've got pistol grips. It's a pistol grip, which I, I personally prefer the pistol grips over um, the long ones, but the long ones I've used for many, many years. So that's just a, an ordinary, I don't know, it must have a special name, but I'll call that a long grip. That's a pistol grip. And I'll show you the difference in the teeth between, say, a tenon saw and a dovetail saw. Let's see if we can do it on this one here. That's a tenon saw. See how fine they are? That's about 22 TPI, I reckon. Am I close? No, 20. There you go. That's a 20 TPI. That's about a 13 TPI. So the finer the cut, the neater the job's going to be. And here's, here's a couple of old hacks, exactly the same thing. Dovetail saws at the top much finer teeth, and the tenon saw at the bottom. So the finer the teeth, the better you're going to find your, your woodwork. And also, you've got to have sharp chisels. If your chisels aren't sharp, go and sharpen them before you even try to do some dovetails. Fix all that up in a tick. Whoops. Where am I up there? Let's have a chat with me, mouse. Morning, Thomas. Oh, did I say that? Hi, Steve, working perfectly. Morning, Thomas. <laughs> Gertrude, did you get a suntan? Uh, good day, Bob. Uh, Steve, not many of the old crew here today must <laughs> Yeah, yeah that'll be right. <laughs> it's all right, Theo. The cream of the bunch is here. All right, so. How to set out dovetails. Let's do some dovetails on this. And first of all, work out how many dovetails. Oh, before I get into that, I'll just touch on, I know there's commercial jigs around that you can use a router on. You can cut uh, dovetails on a bandsaw. You can cut dovetails on a table saw. And the jigs which you can get, uh, I think there's ones that spring to mind, I think. Um, there's a Gifton jig, there's a Lee, Lee jig, an Inkra jig, and I know there's some generic ones out there that you use a dovetail around a bit on. If I can find one over here, I'll show you what a dovetail around a bit looks like. And, and again, they come in the same two sizes, a six in one and an eight in one. I think these are both 18 ones. And there they are. There. And they're fine. They, they are fine, and you'll get dovetails cut with those. The reason I don't like them, and I much prefer cutting dovetails by hand, is I have more control over the design and the placement of the dovetails. I've got a box over here. Can't find the lid to it. I don't know where that's gone. But so often I've seen people, they'll make a box with um, dovetails in it and then they'll have to cut through a dovetail when they take the lid off because the jig that they're using only allows them a certain size. Whereas, yeah, I wish I could find the top to that. If you set them out yourself and cut them, you can then design it so, in this case, um, I've got, whoops, there we go, I've got dovetails here and then the lid, I had two smaller dovetails. So when I cut the lid off, that was cut off by hand, when I cut the lid off, it 
actually didn't cut the dovetail. So when the lid's closed, I've got four full dovetails here, and then I've got two smaller dovetails on the roof. So that's, um, oh, that was an exercise. And they're the two main dovetails you'll set up. That's called a through dovetail, where it goes, where are we? Come here. I've got that camera too high on it. That's the through dovetail, where the dovetail goes all the way through. And then you've got a half lap dovetail, which is generally what you have on drawer fronts, because you don't see the drawer dovetails coming through. They're enclosed like that, whereas the back of the drawer is generally exposed. Actually, I'll show you on this one. Sam, Sam we've got a real one here. There you go, so that's the front of the cabinet. The dovetails are on the side, but when you turn it around the back, the dovetails actually go all the way through. For my two bobs worth, if it's worth anything, I think the through dovetails are harder to do than the half lap dovetails. Because the half lap dovetail, you can hide a lot of mistakes. The through dovetail, mm -mm. You can't, but there are ways you can remedy that. Let me just get a bit of glue off there. Oh dear. Just bring out and buy a new mat. Then I'll go. I'll go and nick one from the wife's sewing machine. That's uh, sewing room. All right. So we've covered the different angles, saws. Chisels, chisels have to be sharp. And with a chisel, to do dovetails successfully, you really need to have a beveled chisel. Now this is a, a firmer, and you'll notice it's got square, whoops, it's got square faces on it. Now that's generally for cutting out mortises, whereas a bevel chisel, has bevels on the side. And you need that, and you'll see it when we start cutting the sockets out, you need that bevel so you can get in underneath the dovetails and clean them out. So, uh, beveled chisels are the go. Here's another one, this is a Robert Sorby one. And it's got that bevel on there. You can cut mortises with beveled chisels, you can't cut dovetails with mortars chisels. There you go. You can do box joints. All right. So we'll get back into that. What else do you need? Oh, look, that's just about the main thing. Okay, now setting out. Work out how many dovetails you want. And this also can reflect on the ratio that you set your dovetails at because you might go, oh, I'm going to go six in one and I want five dovetails. And if you do that, all of a sudden, um, it looks out of place because they're too wide at the base of the tail, so you might decide, oh, I think I'll go a six and a half or a seven in one. But anyway, needless to say, this is an area that a lot of people spend hours and hours and hours trying to set out dovetails, so I'll show you an easy way. So this measures, it doesn't matter if you use metric or uh, imperial. Well, that measures three and five eighths. Let's go metric. It measures 92 mil. And I want to have four dovetails. How do you work out Four into that. And I have seen people, you divide it in half. Um, which one have I got? There you go. I've seen people, let me see if I've got some here. There you go. 
They'll find the centre. And then they'll work back from the centre. Or they'll measure it and they'll try and step it out with dividers or compasses or whatever. Here is the easiest way I know of setting out dovetails. Doesn't matter how many you want, this method will work without fail. You can use a metric rule or you can use an imperial ruler, it doesn't matter. If I want um, three dovetails, so I'll tell you what, I must have been working during the week. A gunky week. If I want three dovetails, I can divide this board into three. I don't have to have measurements, it doesn't matter. All I do is the bottom corner here, I have resting up on this edge, and then I'll swing this around until I get a number that is divisible by three. So if I go down to 12, that's one point, that's 120 mil there. Divide that by three, that means I put a mark at the four and one at the eight, and that's divided into three equal parts. What I want to do with this, I want four dovetails, so I'm gonna put this here. <laughs> I should rub those out, because I'm gonna get confabricated otherwise. There you go, okay. I want four dovetails. I'll use the same thing. Put this right on the corner. Swing this around until I get 12 there. I could, I could if I like, I could go to 16. And then mark that off in fours. Four, eight, 12. That gives me one, two, three, four dovetails. If I did the same thing, put it there and we'll go to one point two. And I mark it off in threes. That's three, six, nine, 12. Now if you have a look at those, those two marks, that one there and that one there are the same spacing. That one and that one's the same spacing. And this one and this one are the same spacing. Again, if you used inches, you could have that there, spin that round to four inches and just mark off one, two, three, four. They're going to be identical. That's how you divide any board up into equal parts. Much easier than guessing and trying to work it out with feeler gauges and whatever. <laughs> Dear men, conflicted, conflicted, confused and bemused. I belong to the, the Wood Turner's fraternity of the bewildered. Tim Tams in the car. Oh, good on you, Trevor. Bacon and eggs. I haven't had breakfast yet. Dear, oh dear. Anyway, what we've done, we've done that. Now I'm going to do, 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 do. I will mark this quite severely, only so you can see what we're doing. Normally I wouldn't because it's going to mark the job. One, two. Okay. Turn the camera on. So you can see those indentations. That's four equal portions. And what I'm going to do now is grab... ...a square and just carry those up to this end. So bring that one down. Bring that one down. And bring that one down. So now I've got four pencil lines. One, two, three, or three pencil lines, but four spaces. Put that in the vise. And what I like to do is just get a knife and just put a little knife cut on each of those lines. So now that's actually brought it over to the top so I can 
bring those over. When you, whenever you're marking anything, that's I'll bring the other camera over, because I'm left-handed and you won't be able to see otherwise. Here you go. Whenever you're marking anything, instead of putting the square onto the mark, and then I'm marking with a knife, by the way, you can use a pencil, but I prefer a knife because it gives me a much finer uh, mark to, to work to. So when you're marking and you're using a square, instead of putting the square onto the mark, it's much more accurate to put your knife on the mark then move your square up to the knife. One mark, square under the knife, Knife into the square. There you go. So now we've got one, two, three, four spaces. What I will do, so you can see, I'll actually put pencil in there so you can see the marks. There you go. Now that's giving you the four spaces, but now you've got to draw the dovetails in. And what I do is, and that, look, honestly, if I was running this stream, uh, say I did it over six weeks or eight weeks, and it was basically the same thing, showing you how to cut dovetails, I would do it eight different ways. It's not because <laughs> I want to show you I'm clever, it's the other way around. I can't remember which way I did it. But I know the end result that I want. So don't get locked into there is only one way to cut dovetails. It's whatever way suits you and works for you. The set outs are the same. So if you do it differently, but you get the results you want, hey, more power to you. Keep on doing it that way. Now I'm going back to Imperial because I like eighths of an inch. And these lines, I'm gonna draw an eighth of an inch or mark an eighth of an inch either side of that line. Should have me other glasses on, but this I tell you. And then from the end, come in one eighth from each end. And then I will bring those across. Put your knife in the mark. Knife in the mark. Draw it down. Knife in the mark, move the square up, draw it down. Knife in the mark, move the square up, make the cut. Knife in the mark, draw it down. And try and do it in one cut if you can because you don't want tram tracks. And on the last one, good on you, on the last one you're better off either turning a job around or turning the square around because you're not stable. It's going to rock. So in that case, I just turn that around, put the knife in the mark, pull it down, and I've got to find that mark there. There you go. All right. You can see there now, I've got an eighth of an inch, a quarter of an inch, quarter of an inch, quarter of an inch, and an eighth of an inch. But these tails are still the same width. On these marks, I like to come over again and just bring it down onto the face. And there, there is a way you can do dovetails and you don't even need to set it up, you just do it with a saw. And um, if I'm doing a lot and it's not for a, a really special piece, I'll just freehand them. The tails themselves aren't as crucial as the sockets or the pins because 
we'll cut the pins and the sockets, or sockets. I prefer calling them pins, I think. UK call them sockets. They have to then fit the tail. So no matter what disaster happens with the tails, providing you make, cut the pins to match, it's going to be good. Now the other thing I do is I've got, I've got a 2B pencil and I mark in the waste because it, you don't want to get halfway through doing something and you just realise, and I've done it, I've cut a pin out and I've left the waste in. So if you just give it a bit of colour like that, you know where the pencil is, is where you have to mark. Now we'll use a, um, a gauge, if I can find the thing, there we go. I'll use a six in one on this. And I just, oh hang on, first of all, we've got to work out. We might do it on a, we might do it on a smaller bit here. You've got to work out what thickness you're going to have that is going to butt up to it. Because then we've got to mark that in. Uh, let me see. Now uh, we might. I don't know. I'm, I'm having a thought. What do you want me to do? Do you want me to do through the yeah, you, audience involvement? Do you want me to do three through dovetails or half lap dovetails? Put in number one if you want half lap. Put in number two if you want through dovetails. Ha, da -da -da -da. Nobody, come on, somebody give me a try. I don't want to make a decision this morning. All right, well, no one's talking to me. Trevor, number one, half lap. Okay, half lap is what we'll do. Okay, so we'll put it in to this side here. Um, Oh, hang on, I've got to do half. No, that's all right, we'll still do half. Okay, work out how far you want. Oh, you need marking gauge. It's always good too if you've got three or four marking gauges. I did have four, but I don't know where the other one is. So we'll have to make do with three. On the piece that's going to have the, the pins, you've got to work out how much you want left, so I reckon that's, I'm not even going to measure it, that looks pretty good to me. Yeah, that'll do. And set one of your marking gauges up. Put a mark down there. And that is how deep I'm getting confused here. It's not hard for me. Yeah, we do it on this one. Okay. This is how deep the tails are going to be. So where we've marked here, lightly mark a line around here. That's a, a way to always tell if Dovetails have been hand cut, if you can't tell just by looking. If you can see a scratch mark or a gauge mark all the way around, you know they're hand, well, nine times out of ten it means they're hand cut. Okay. I'll do this a bit heavier than I would normally on a job, only so you can see it. There we go. And that is that depth there. Okay. All right. So there's our depth line and these are the intervals. So now get your marking gauge or your dovetail gauge. Uh, what? And no, I'll do that in a minute. 
Where's my knife? Here we go. So make sure you've got it so you're going to make a dovetail. If I go this way, obviously it's the wrong way because the fattest part of the fan is down the bottom and it won't work. Put the knife in your mark, slide your gauge up to it, do a mark. Then you miss one and then go to the next. Put your mark, miss the next one, do the next one. Miss one and do the last one. Flip the gauge over and go back the other way. Oops, see I made a mistake there. I did too. That's why it's, I like putting pencil in so I know what I'm cutting. Hello, Bob. Gee, I wish you would shut the door after you, I really do. And we've got this last one to do here. And we'll colour that in. So there's a tail, there's a tail, there's a tail, there's a tail. You can do it on the other side if you desire. Let me just shut the door. Awful quiet, isn't it? And the last one. Colour in the waist side. That looks pretty darn close, I think. Now, another thing I like to do, which I, I didn't used to do, but as time marches on and your eyes get a bit not quite as good as they were, I like to put a bit of masking tape around that line. If you can divide that gauge line in half, and that way... And I, I don't think there's any disgrace in doing this at all. That way you can get to see the line you're working to a lot easier. Now we'll pop it in the vise. And we will start cutting. You can um, pre-drill. I've seen people, what they do is they'll drill these bits out to get rid of waste. But quite frankly, why bother? Just use the saw to do the job. And what size saw? Use a Japanese saw. Thing with Japanese saws, remember they cut on the back stroke. So don't have your thumb behind it like that when you're using it. As I have done on several occasions. Here you go. 
Now, some people, and again, this is personal preference, they will put it in an angle, at an angle like that, so they're cutting straight down. For me, look, just put it this way and, and get used to cutting at an angle. Because if you ever want to do these freehand, that's what you do, you just put it in there, you cut, excuse me, you cut all one way, turn the saw over, cut the other way and you've got your angle. Now what we're going to do is cut on the waist side of those marks. So don't cut exactly on the mark, just cut a little bit outside the mark. And be mindful if you're watching the back, I like to have the saw tilted a little bit because I'll hit the back here before I hit the front and I should be a little bit high on that masking tape on the, the front that I can come back and do later on. A little technique if you want, if you're doing lap joints particularly, if you just bend the saw slightly so you get a little bit of a camber happening, it does help them fit a bit better. Okay, so there's a first cut. I'm on the line with those, and on this side, I'm a little bit high of that tape. So I'll turn that around, and then I'll just bring them down to that tape line. Just let the weight of the saw do the job. Don't push it. That one I might have gone a little bit too far. On. Then we'll go back the other way. down the line. Now put it in the vise this way and we'll cut these ends off here. A little again work on the the waist side of the line. Clean the rest up with a chisel. Now we've got to remove the waste in between here. For that, there's many things you could use. Let me see if I've got. Oh, I did have. Oh, they're all on the top shed. All right. Uh, look, you can use. A coping saw, which is one of these. Where are you? There you go. And slide it down and cut the waste out this way. And then you come back the other way. But my preferred method Bob, you are a pest, aren't you? Hey, go on, out you go. 
is I like using a much finer blade and you will see why if I can find the saw. Here we go. And I'll, I picked this one up, picked this one up from Carbotech the other day. And it really is a very nice little saw. It takes, I've got this predecessor here somewhere or other. Oh dear. This is an old, much older version, uh, but it takes a scroll saw blade, a pinless scroll saw blade. And I was really pleased to see that they brought these back. Now that's loose. So what I'm gonna do is tighten it, and it's just a hand tighten. Lock the knurled nut up here and you can hear that. So the reason I like these is when I'm cutting, see how this one I've had to cut down there and I've got a fair bit of stuff I've got to clean up there. Whereas with these, with a very, very fine blade, I can go down... And just staying just above the line, I've taken all that waste out. So it helps me when I'm cleaning them up. See if you can get hold of one. That's a what is it? Pegasus adjustable SMSA frame. There you go. But they really are nice. What I'll do is I'll, oh no, I'll leave that in there because I'll show you how to clean that up. So there's the rough cut dovetails. Move that all out the way. Don't put any water in there, that's good. With me so far. I know it's long winded, but we're getting there. Steve, why mark on both sides if it is. A half joint. Uh, yeah, good point. No real reason. It's just when you're cleaning out, you know that you've got it square because if you've got one side a bit fatter than the other and it's a side you're not going to see, it's not going to fit. So if you can just work to the line on both sides, it makes it easier to fit. Ha! I love you! Darth! Yes! I'm younger than Rob Crosman. <laughs> oh, don't I wish. <laughs> okay. Oh, dear. Now, where are we? Okay, now we're going to clean these up. What I do is I'll get a sacrificial piece of, you can use, you could use a plastic mat or you can use a piece of timber. For me, I prefer using timber and you will see why. Uh, get a block. This. <laughs> This block of timber, I think, has been making dovetails for me for, crikey, must be over 30 years. Uh, and all it is, there's a bit of quill, it doesn't matter what it is. But this edge, I know is flat, and it is square to this surface. That's all you need. Bit of plywood. And let's go back to, oh, where do we go, all cams, what happens then? Okay, I'll do this here and then bring that one up and you can see that and turn that one around. Oh, Hayden technology, great. If I could do it without leaves, I'd be happier. All right, so I've got a bit of plywood. There's my workpiece. I've got a block of wood that is known square. A squirt bottle with some water in it. A little squirt on the bottom of the job, squirt on the top, squirt on the block. Now, I'm going to work out which way I'm going to do this. I'll do it this way. Move, and a light. If you've got a light, that's good to have too because you can actually see your work then. Move this right up onto that line and then clamp it to the bedge. Now I know that square 
So if I'm using that as a, a brace from the chisel, I'm going to be cutting square. Oh, I don't know what size it is. So it's either three eight or a quarter of an inch. Three eight, that'll do. Okay. And here we go. So I start, actually this one here, that I did with the coping saw, it's wider, narrower than 3 8 so I'm going to flare those tails out if I use, so I use a quarter inch chisel and I bear down. I'm not going all the way through, I'm just going halfway or just over halfway and I'm going to change my glasses. Doesn't the world look different when you can see it? Okay. Now I should be able to use a 3.8. Yep. And you can see that's a great example of why you've got to have a bevel chisel because the bevels are actually sliding underneath into the taper of the dovetail itself. <laughs> One bad thing with these glasses, I can see what I'm doing, but I can't see the TV screen. Okay, here we go. So now I'm going to keep the back of the chisel flat against my block and just tear down. Here we go. Same here, come away from the block a little bit. Now just pair down. Away from the block. And bring it back. And the same on these end ones. And this is why it's critical that you have sharp chisels. Or else you're going to be in a world of pain. I'm just going to clean that tail up a little bit. This one here, just miss that. There you go. Motor bomb. Turn it over. And you notice we've still got all this bulk here. Sometimes if you go all the way through, you actually get a blowout and it'll pull the timber out from the face, which you don't want to happen. You go, Bob! Don't take any prisons, mate. Where'd my clamp go? I, I don't know, so I'll use this one. Clamp it down. If you need to adjust that clamp, put sort of even pressure on it, and then you can just tap it up onto the line using a hammer. And then we'll go back to... Oh! My bonnet just fell off my microphone. Wait a minute. It's going to get a bit scratchy here, people. There you go. Again, only go halfway, but it should put you into open space. This other one, we've got to take a smaller chisel to it to start with. There's always an ongoing argument to, oh, do you cut the pins first or the tails first? Well, I always cut the tails first, and I can't see any advantage of cutting the pins first, but I can see the advantage of cutting the tails first, especially 
if you're going to make a sliding dovetail. Again, no right or wrong. I think leaf chisels have cut that many dovetails, they should be able to cut them themselves. Okay, getting a bit of drama there. That's all right though. And a big chunk came out the middle, but you're not going to see that. Now come down on the line of the dovetail there. Square them up. Great sound that, isn't it? Okay. I think that's taken care of that. All right, the dovetails are cut. And to be honest, they're, they're the first dovetails I've cut for months. Clean up, if you've got a nice sharp knife, just clean up inside the corners to get rid of any waste that's still there or dags that are hanging on. This one appears to be a little bit fatter than the rest. But that's part of the joy of hand woodworking, I suppose. All right, now we'll lay the pins out. A couple of ways you can do that. Here's a great, great thing that you can make that really helps. Oh, it's a, well, I've seen a lot of people do it and it works quite well. And I used to use it myself. Um, no. That's the one I want. is put a plane there the piece that you're going to put your pins into there and then lay the tails on the plane like that but but, 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 I'll show you this other great idea, which I think is far better, and you can make it, you can make it. I originally saw this, oh, years ago, must have been 10 years ago at least, uh, David Barron, I think his name is, in the UK, uh, made one of these. And I don't know what he calls his, I call mine a dovetail sled. And all it is, this one's actually doweled together. Uh, let's see if I can give you a better look. It's doweled together on a mitre joint. You could use the dovetail. We might even do this as a project one day. Who knows? And it's got a gutter down here. And then I've got a piece of brass strap all the way around. And it's at 90 degrees. So what you do with this one is put your pin board in. Pop it in the vise, like that. Make the pin board level with the deck. Tighten it up, get your tails, put it against the rail, then you can bring it up and way to go. It is so much more convenient doing it that way than the other way because you've got a fence here. The plane works fine, but you can knock it off askew. Whereas when you've got that fence up there and this channel 
down here, it's to just get any dust or muck that might get in the way. If we need it, we can put a light on top of that so we can see what we're doing. Lined it up to the mark. Get a knife. Now this is important that you use a knife when marking the pins. So I said dovetails, it's not as critical. You can use a pencil. But if you start using a pencil line when you're cutting the pins, you can get confused because, oh, do I cut on the inside of the pencil line? Do I cut on the outside? Do I cut on the pencil line? Whereas if you've got a knife, you have a really, really accurate mark. So that's there, holding that nice and firm. You can clamp it if you like. And just draw in. Tails and come back in this way. A bit too far with that, but that's all right. And there you go. Are they all marked? Yep. So, what I'm going to do here, if I can, you can see they're cut, I'm going to mark the waist. And the waist is where the dovetails are actually going to go in. Once again, I'll mark with a knife Just where the pins are outlined. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There we go. So I've just got little indentations in there. So now I can bring it over and bring those lines down. And we want them to come down the thickness of this board. You can either put your board on there like that and mark it with a knife. Or if you prefer, this is why I like multiple gauges. Especially if, you've got a, if you're doing a lot. You see, if you finish hand planing these, you could be a little bit out. So if you're using a marking gauge, you're going to have the same distances. Whereas if you just mark it out like I did then, putting a board on can make a bit of difference. Now we'll just mark down there. You don't have to mark the ends because all we're doing is taking these pins out. Okay, and get some masking tape. If ow, if if you want. Now, continue these lines down to the masking tape. What I do, put the knife in the slot, move the square up, and then take the knife out, and then pull it towards me. That way I'm not going to run the risk of actually coming down under my job. And I know you might be getting a bit of flare there, so you can't see what I'm doing with the square. But at this point in time, it's more important I know what I'm doing. And there you can see I've... Whoops. Got those. Again with a pencil, mark out where you're going to cut away. So 
So there's, there's my waste marks and there's my waste marks there. <coughs> Pop it in the vise. And I'll have a chat first. We're getting a bit of a chat happening there. Ah, dear. In memory of that video of Rob Croven, which was a while back, you might say, <laughs> I, I wouldn't have a clue. I wouldn't have a clue on that one. Uh, Darth, I, I seldom watch much YouTube. Well, um, not woodworking YouTube. Mainly for that reason, because I don't want to go, oh, such a, and then someone goes, oh, but you learned that from so-and-so. He took, no, it's a coincidence. I mean, there's, there's only a few ways of doing things and we all pick up on different things. But it uh, is interesting sometimes to see what other people are doing. But no, I'm not familiar with that particular video. <clears throat> Love that jig. It's the simplest I've seen, but one of the best. Yeah, well, I'll give credit to... Uh, <laughs> David, David, David. I did say it before. It, it slipped me mine. Um, anyway, yes. Whoever I said before, oh dear, oh dear. Um, yeah, woodworkers, yeah, they're sharp little suckers, those, I tell you. Oh, thanks, Trev. Yeah, we're doing half lap. Oh, the block jig, yeah. No, that is, it's, um, that, yeah, that goes back, there. Jeff Hanna showed me that one, if you're familiar with Jeff Hanna's work. Okay. So what we're going to do now is cut the pins out. And to do that, how are we going? How are we going, going, going? We've got that one there, so you can see that. And this one here, so you can see that. Again, using the Japanese saw. There you go. Come in at an angle and also the saw in there. Obviously, you can't cut like that. You can, I'll show you a couple of ways of doing this, um, shall I? No, no, we'll cut them first. Now, on the waist side, so I'm actually cutting on the inside, on the socket side. And I've got two lines to go to. I've got to go to this back line and I've got to go to this side line. And three lines, actually, and the one down the bottom. So, there you go. Other way. Whoop. A little bit loose on that one. We'll be mindful to get on the waist side. It's much easier to pair stuff out than glue stuff in. Although I have done it. All right. So we've cut down there, we've cut as close as we can to that line, we've cut on an angle. Next thing is to get the chisels out. There's several ways you can do this. So I, I'm not going to pre-explain what I'm going to do because I've got no idea which way I'm going to do it at the moment. Just hang in there. We'll, we'll, we'll get it done, we'll get it done. Oh dearie, dearie, dear. Okay. What have we got? Three, eight, little there. Uh, you can use a hammer or a mallet, whatever suits your boot. Now come away from the line to start with. Make sure you got the right one. And a couple of knocks. Away from the line. Very similar to the way you would do a mortise. Now, 
Now, I'll actually I'll do I'll do them a couple of different ways. Now I've done that. I've cleared the way so when I put the chisel on the tape line and knock down, there's a cavity there that this material can go into, which will give me a sharp cut right on that line. Can you see I'm right on that line? Where if I hadn't have done that relief cut and I did a cut like this right on the line because the design of the chisel, it would push the cut back. So it's very important to remember to put that relief cut in. Actually, I'll, I'll show you, I'll show you what I mean. Is this, um, so we'll do a bit of tape. All right, so there's two marks, one there, one there. I will do a relief cut and then I'll come back. You see how that's cut straight on that line. If I put my chisel here, right on that line to start with, without a relief cut, it's not so bad there, but it'll actually cut back into the tape. Whereas here I get a much cleaner cut. So I, I just thought I'd throw that bit in. Where, where are we up to? Okay, we're back with this stuff. So now we've started to register down there. What we're going to do is clean out the waste that's on the top. A couple of ways you can do it. You can either put it back in the vise and knock down with a chisel like that. And you can see I'm taking all that waste out and then just push forward and clean it out. As it gets wider, obviously, you can use a wider chisel if you want. just shear that off either straight in like this or what I'll prefer to do is get that block out that I was using before and use that use a wider chisel there now I think down on that line. A 
Again, I can't stress enough the importance of sharp chisels. Find that pin by going right down that cut line we had. Now we started to expose this pin here. That's the socket, that's the pin. I will do it a different way here because it's quicker. Well, quicker for me. Bit of water. Uh, hold down here somewhere. Okay. Somebody said the other day, you should never use the palm of your hand against the chisel. Well, I'm not. I'm using this bony part here against there. I wouldn't use that because it's going to damage it. But if you're using right on the end, it's okay. But again, whatever makes you feel comfortable. When, uh, if you're doing a lot, I actually set them out in batches. So I'd set out, uh, say I had two drawers, that's four fronts. I would set out the fronts in one hit. Just put them all together in the vise and draw them all up in one go. And yeah, it does take time. As I think I said at the beginning, I think it's harder to do a good fitting hatch mortise and, mortise and tenon than dovetails. It's pretty easy, I reckon. Okay. Now we've got the bulk of that out. I'm going to put it back in the vise now and we can do a final cleanup, I think. I find if I don't talk when, I, when I'm doing this, I don't cut myself either. So please excuse me if I'm not chatting. OK. 
cameras just aren't playing the game today. Now I'm right over the top of the job, change my glasses, and I'm actually paring down to those mark lines. And that, to me, is pretty darn good. Uh, if you're tempted, if you're on the mark line and you've got, oh, maybe a mill, don't take it in one go. Creep up on it. Because you have no idea what that grain is doing underneath. It might look good, and then all of a sudden you push down and the grain could have a turn in it and you can actually go right through the other side of the job which is annoying good to have a little knife that you can clean up with also if you can get one there's not many of them around I know but a 1 8 chisel is something that you can use a lot when you do dovetails. Just getting into the corners. So what we might do later on too is um, We might do a full project actually, make some drawers and doors and then we can get into the finer points of drawer making. That's pretty good, that one's pretty good. We'll just clean this one up. When you come to fitting too, if it doesn't fit, clean it up or make the adjustments on the pins, not on the dovetails. We're looking pretty good here. And can you see that with that bevel, how I can get into this corner? Whereas if I had a square chisel, I can't get into that corner. If I turn it to get into that corner, I'm gouging out here. And if I go straight down there, I'm missing the corner. So again, <coughs> bevel chisels. Okay, moment of truth. And there are the pins. Whoops. There you go. So we'll take the tape off. Ah. 
And did we clean this up? I can't remember. Oh yeah, these have all been cleaned up. So let's see how close I got. I think we should have full screen for this. With, with me in the corner so you can see, see my shocked face. There you go. All right. Ready? Get a, um, again, a, a piece of scrap timber. Anything will do. Whoop, what's that? That'll do. And place the board in there. Bit of scrap on the top. Gentle tap. See how we're going. Oops. Okay, a little bit on that shoulder to take off. And then I'm going to be pretty happy with that, I think. That wasn't an adjustment, I was just actually taking it down to the line. Just gonna put a bit of water in there. And there's a Who's been in my workshop? There you have it. By the time that's been glued in, that's going to be looking pretty good. There's a clean front, and there's the dovetails on the side. There you go. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. That was fun. I, I just love doing things unplanned. But anyway, that's how you do dovetails. Not hard, just take your time. Ah, uh, um, I need a number. I've got to go back half an hour. What are we doing? <laughs> I thought you said bear down. No, Thomas, definitely. Well, you do your bear down on the chisel as you pair down on the, the cut, I suppose. There you go. You could do that. Uh, who's been in my workshop? Yeah, I think I'm Bob. Well, that's it. So that's all there is to do in dovetails. Um, through dovetails, it's exactly the same, only you don't have this lip on the end. And as I said, I think they're easier to do than the through dovetails, but a lot of people have never tried a half lap. 
So give it a go. You never know. You might find something you enjoy doing. But uh, what tricks can I give you? Accurate measurement, particularly on the pin side. Uh, oh, I'll tell you what I'll do. We'll, we'll just... I'll do a freehand. Oh, I'll do a freehand um, dovetail. I won't cut it out because you cut it out exactly the same Ooh, way. But mark out... Uh, no, we won't even do a mark. I'll just... I'll put a depth mark of how deep I want to go. I might go that deep. And I'll use just an ordinary gent saw, which is where. I don't know how sharp these are. So we'll give it a go. There we go. All right, this is just freehand. So if you've got nothing and you haven't got any jigs but you still want to do dovetails, this is how you do dovetails. Set yourself up in a comfortable position and find an angle that you uh, are pleased with, basically. And then start, come in about an uh, eighth of an inch. And do your cut. Over here, and do another one. Come back the other way. The only reason I'm using that other saw is because I don't know where it is, I can't find it. There you go. If you want, that was totally freehand. As I said, that was totally freehand. They're most likely not identical. They might not even be correctly spaced. But if you're in a pinch and you've got to get something done in a hurry, that's a quick way of doing them. And I think that was less than a minute. So anyway, horses for courses. Um, I think that the precision of laying out dovetails, the reason I love dovetails, I guess it's the same reason I love marquetry, is because I can lose myself in it. It's one of those things where you've got to have total focus and all the worries of the world just pass you by and you're in the zone and you're, you're doing woodwork and it's with hand tools and if you're lucky enough you've got an aromatic timber you're working with, all your senses are involved and... Uh, you're creating something, you're using your hands, your mind, and your imagination. And it's woodworking, so it's got to be all good. Okay, any questions or any suggestions of what you like on future streams? If you've got any um, suggestions and you are watching this 
when it's not live, just let the people at Carbotech know and they will pass messages on or we can organise um, some tutorials or demonstrations or answer questions that you might have. There's the, the clamp I was looking for. Oh, let me see. Oh. See you, Trevor! How do you find the new saw compared to the other one you use? There's a big difference in price. Uh, the, the, the thing I do like about this one, and it's not, where's the other one? Here we go. It's no detriment to this one, so this one works really well. I'm using exactly the same blade in it. The thing is that one has a, a deeper throat. But look, if, um, you know, if you can get hold of one of these, they are just as good. The scroll saw blade I use is, I think it's an 02. I thought it was an 05, but an 025 inch FD SR20 24 TPI, eight reverse teeth. And it's really, really fine. If you're doing marquetry, that's what I use it on, and that's what I use. What? Where are we? That's what I have in that scroll saw. It's a very, very fine blade, and when I'm doing pierce work, I use another a number seventy drill bit, which is. that drill bit there. So to give you an idea, that's the edge of a ruler and the drill bit is thinner than the edge of the ruler. So no, look, these, these work fine. Um, so I've got no drums with it. The thing I like with this, you can tension it quite easily with the hand. When you finish using these too, just undo that nut and relieve the tension on the um, blade so it's a bit wobbly. That way you find your blades will last a lot longer. So that's it. If there's nothing else, I'm out of here. I'm going to go and have some breakfast. Thank you all for your company. I think Carpetech's still open. You can give them a call. And um, thanks for Carpetech too for letting me on to your channel and just... I don't know, sharing some of the things that I've learned along the way. I hope it's helpful to you. And uh, I look forward to catching up to some of you in person. Who knows, I might even see you in the store. But until then, I'll sign off in my usual fashion and say, remember to keep it sharp. But more importantly, keep it safe. Look after yourself. Look after your tools. And I look forward to uh, the next room we have together on the YouTube Carbotech channel and the wonderful world of woodworking. Till then, I bid you all good day, good afternoon, good night, and happy woodworking. Bye for now. That's it. I, I haven't got yeah, I haven't got an outro. Get me an outro. Because I can't use that one. All right, I'm out of here. Bye. <laughs>